Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you could join the YouTube channel at even $1 a month or head over to patreon.com slash oxum or oxum.substack.com. Today, our special guest is Zoe. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti. I had to sneak, sneak that in there while we're still in the... Uh, Pascal um, season. I I mainly want to ask you today about the uh, late great John McAfee, um, a memory eternal, whose uh, two year anniversary is actually coming up um, not not too far from now in, in a in a few weeks. But um, before we get there, because it's it was a, I think it's an amazing story how you guys linked up. How um, how did you? begin to kind of uh, make a brand for yourself on social media. And um, I wonder, like, what was your your first one? I'll, I'll date myself a little bit and throw out, like, live journal and uh, forums. There was actually one called Habasha.com that I used to be on as, like, a 13-year-old. But uh, mm -hmm. what was, like, your first social media, and how did you, like, build a brand there? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's a, a pretty good question. I am, uh, I guess I am in the Zoomer generation, but uh, my father worked in tech so i had a computer from a pretty young age and uh nice. being unsupervised i was pretty quickly on forums and things like that um honestly i think the very first one i would have been on was a now extinct forum called tech forums i think and it was as the name uh describes based on um you know tech and things like that and i think i was on there for video games um i would say the first site I kind of got addicted to was Reddit. Um, and from there, it was kind of all downhill as I got on Twitter and uh, chans and things like that, as as you might imagine. But uh, no, I mean, I had definitely had like the last kind of gasps of forum life uh, at a pretty young age. The, yeah, very similar, actually. Uh, and fascinating. Yeah, even like you said, with the generational gap, we still had kind of a, a similar path. I was never like properly Reddit tier. I have an account and I would like look things up, you know what I yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I really hate uh, notifications. I don't know if you're aware of like the urban <laughs> space and like the light yeah. phone movement and things like that. So um, I relate a lot to those and, uh, you know, some people get mad at me for it, but like I mm -hmm. try turning all my notifications off. It doesn't mean I'm just like not still extremely online, but I want to yeah. kind of approach it uh, from there. The gamer thing is actually uh, interesting. Were you ever, I have to ask, like a Jason or a part of Gamergate or were you very far from all that? So I never had a particularly strong opinion on it, um, but I had friends who very much were on both sides, if you want to call them that. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I, I was always like kind of confused what it was about. I mean, obviously I'm very familiar now, but at the time mm -hmm. as like a teenager, I was like, I don't know, I'm just kind of trying to play video games. Like, I don't really get what this is all about, but I definitely knew people who were um, spending probably more time than they should have um, and, and raptured in that, uh, that world. <laughs> yeah. I would say while it was going on uh, again, even though I was like older, I, I still didn't really get it. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until after the fact that I started to see this kind of um, usually like male gamer versus journal type, you know, beef that was going on. And it wasn't until much after that I had any semblance of what was going on. It seemed like everybody was such an insider. You know, you're in some groups, people use mm -hmm. like acronyms all the time. Like mm -hmm. there was so mm -hmm. much insider lingo that I just felt like I didn't uh, understand it. And maybe I had stepped away. I actually haven't, the last console I owned was PS3. And that was probably in 2016. Like since 2017, I haven't had a console. So I've been mm -hmm. away from it. But were you more of a PC gamer or a console gamer? And if so, Definitely. what was it? I mean, I had an Xbox 360 and that was like, I used that a lot in middle school, but um, my father, the first video game I got was my father got me Star Wars Battlefront 2 for PC. Um, and I have pretty strong memories of like installing like six different CDs. Um, you know, obviously it's not that old, but you know, thinking about games now, the idea of waiting like several hours while you just like take one CD and then put in the next CD is pretty funny. 
Yeah, that game was uh, interestingly allowed you to be OP very quickly because mm -hmm. I I was very dominant actually at that game. But oh, yeah. like the moments where you unlock a Jedi or a Sith because you yeah. can be like mm -hmm. a, a kind of I think it was like third person shooter, not quite mm -hmm. first person. Um, but it was like you have a, like a little stormtrooper or a re rebel fighter, uh, which is kind of analogous to Call of Duty or other shooting games. But then you could just out of nowhere get like floating Vader and yeah. <laughs> fight. So that was um, that's cool. But yeah. Uh, so you did, you <laughs> made it to the CD generation. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, it's funny, people still uh, sell things um, like that. There was mm -hmm. recently a uh, a vlogger uh, who traveled to Eritrea, a sister country to Ethiopia, and he was surprised in a store they were still selling um, a VCD, I don't know if you ever heard of that technology, slash VHS uh, player in one. I, I'm sure you knew the DVD VHS player, but yeah. the, the VCD was, I think, a technology that only made it to the third world. And it was basically discs that were cheaper, which meant that you couldn't fit as much data on them. So they were still mm, discs. Okay. They weren't VHS, but they just had less like data capacity. I forget exactly how much. And so you'd have to have like two for a movie, like a, like a normal length uh, feature film would be on two like vcds instead of one but it's like otherwise the same quality as a as a as a dvd so uh, a lot of yours are uh, the social media you've selected then seem to be high in verbal intelligence were you ever active on like facebook or instagram or tiktok or tumblr that were more like picture oriented yeah so i joined facebook pretty well, i think as, as soon as they allowed non-college students i remember it used to have like to have a dot edu Mm -hmm. um but i joined right after that and that was mostly just for keeping up with friends um i never really got into tumblr uh or instagram until you know again instagram kind of replaced facebook for me and now that's like the place where i let my family members know i'm still alive <laughs> by posting a photo every six months or something um but uh tiktok is something that i recently got pretty into because like I don't know because it was newer um and i had found success on a lot of social media sites like you know i built up accounts on different sites i was like well i should at least try it and like see what i can do on there so i did spend like a month where i worked really hard to build up a TikTok account um and then the effort got to be a little much uh when i also had a job at the time uh, well, mm -hmm. I saw the job when i had a job uh so i i only did that for a month um and now i'll check it occasionally but uh just to prove to myself that I could, I did uh, build up a TikTok account to see, see nice. what happened. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I I tried it the first time and mm -hmm. I felt like my attention ban, a span was being assaulted on all sides. <laughs> so I like deleted yeah. the app and then I like got back to it later because I'm a huge uh, Gary V fan. I know it's popular to make fun of him, but mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of him and my own, I would say like content creation is highly influenced by him and he always would be like be everywhere and he knew it when it was actually musically if i'm not mistaken yeah. beforehand and i remember him like talking about musically like years ago and that it would go it was gonna blow up and then now that it's TikTok, it's you know obviously like it's just the best you know people try imitating it like facebook and instagram with their reels yeah. version but it's it's a very, you know, it's like imitation meat, like tempeh, seitan, and tofu, which is just uh, no no bueno. But actually, mm -hmm. this is a great segue because you're a bit of a, a China buff. I'm I'm yeah. wondering, uh, and I, I, I appreciate, like, you and, and I have Carl Zha on my feed, too. Like, mm -hmm. I appreciate people who are, like, genuine China buffs because there's a lot of, I think, like, China just, like, ignoring or ignorance which is inappropriate on the world scene but then there's also like a lot of china hate and um maybe i'm somewhere in between all of that you know um i think it's interesting some of the things they're doing in ethiopia and i'm i'm skeptical of it and in africa at large but i love them as a buffer for the usfg yeah so i'm wondering how you became uh, a china buff and then we can we can segue it to the uh the the late great and powerful john mcafee because i think there's some interesting like tensions and interplays there yeah no definitely i mean um as much as i joke about it online i definitely have my own uh you know con concerns with uh some things that the chinese government does especially as somebody who is so invested in um anti-colonial movements and, and anti-imperialist movements uh anything that even sniffs of that uh always <laughs> makes me uncomfortable but uh 
definitely would not um you know it's 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 way easier to make fun of the china hawks than it is to have kind of a nuanced nuanced discussion about it so that's what happens on twitter but uh, as for where it started um so i grew up mostly in savannah georgia oh um, nice yeah and i felt very cramped by that um it was relatively small i wanted to be in a big city um, you know, I was a big like Anthony Bourdain fan, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so at 14, um, I decided I wanted to run away to another country. Oh, wow. um, and essentially, I kind of just spun the globe and picked the furthest possible place, which is China. Um, and I did some research. I found a program that would let me apply to Chinese high schools um, wow. and find a host family. And then I, um, when I was 15, I went over to Beijing. I studied at um, Beishadar Hujong, uh, the high school attached to Beijing Normal University um, and finished up high school while in Beijing. So Amazing. that was the beginning. That was when I got into Chinese history and started learning a language. You know, I didn't really have like a big interest in China specifically before that. Yeah. Um, if anything, I was more into like, you know, anime in Japan and stuff, but yeah. Uh, once I was there, it was like, I love this. I love everything from the food to the culture to the history. Like it's just like completely uh, enthralled me. So <laughs> were, were classes in English coming from Savannah, Georgia? I, I imagine you didn't like study Mandarin before you went there. Yeah. So I had multiple Mandarin language classes, like studying the language a day. Um, I had math was in English, um, as was um, political science, but history was in Mandarin. Um, so my only Ch Chinese language class that wasn't about like learning the language was history. Wow. And and how did um, your fellow high schoolers receive you? Were you a pariah? Were you a celebrity? <laughs> were you the token? You know? Yeah. So I wasn't the only one there. There were a couple okay. or a decent amount of other students who either did something similar to me or they were diplomat kids or things like that um is there a nice uh westerner thriller like in japanese they say the gaijin is there something like that in chinese yeah there's like guelo and stuff but i think that's a little dated at this point um but uh yeah i um and then you hear bite soul now which it's you know i don't know i've never actually heard anybody say that out loud but people <laughs> online say that um that's but, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like in person, um, people were, yeah, were really accepting. Um, I didn't have great luck making friends with high schoolers there, mm -hmm. which at first I thought was strange until I had a teacher tell me, oh, you should just make friends with college students because all the high schoolers are too busy studying for the Gaokao, the mm -hmm. college admission test. So they don't just hang out with people. <laughs> this is like, you know, you go to, I'm going to a pretty big high school that's like in Beijing. So these are students who are all expecting to go to nice colleges. And it's like, yeah, no, just, just go make friends with college students. They actually have free time and we'll talk to you. Um, and that worked out much better. But um, no, everybody was great. Um, I did make lots of friends. It was uh, very, very accepting. I never had any issues. That's cool. I was, uh, you know, obviously big into manga and anime myself from a young age, more the Shonen Jump stuff, but I would branch out. Mm -hmm. um, was there, uh, did you ever like try sharing your passion for anything Japanese and get pushback for it or no? And then no. <laughs> did you ever so strike up a, any gung fu anywhere? I have a really funny story about this, which is I, there was an anime club um at the school like a uh, an anime club that the students had started and i saw a poster for it um and uh i joined it uh to see what it was like and the immediate response was all of the girls were just like instantly trying to get me to cosplay because uh <laughs> they were like oh we have a white person let's put the white person in cosplay yeah. So that was a little overwhelming, but um, yeah, I mean, they had a pretty sizable anime club. Um, anime and manga is really popular in Japan, especially manga. I mean, sorry, in China, um, especially manga is really popular. That's so cool. Yeah. So, so you did not cosplay then? I was not in the mood, but uh, you know, maybe I should have. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's cool. And 
uh this is uh, this is another like yeah this is a great segue so um maybe enlighten me or surprise me if i'm wrong but what what if anything to your knowledge were john mcafee's views on like china and then could you talk about like how you uh, the story of how you you got hired by him and then i know you started using like um part of the discussion was about what type of anime AVs to be mm -hmm. used and mm -hmm. your experience with that. So uh, <laughs> I remember Cowboy Bebop image. And then I don't know if it was also by the, the by the same creator. I think I had seen an old image you may have used from Samurai Champloo, which I controversially mm -hmm. think is better than uh, Cowboy Bebop, by the way. Well, I agree on that one. So we got that going. Um, nice. Yeah, I mean, as for just the first part there, the, the China opinions, mm -hmm. um, the main like, was he a I China remember, hawk? <laughs> not at all. The main okay. things I remember him saying were that he felt that um, China was not any worse than anything that the U.S. was doing. That was like something he would often say. He would just be like, you know, uh, this is just like another global power, just like the rest of them or whatever. They have similar, you know, uh, he would use the term like totalitarian goals. Um, but... <clears throat> trying to compare us and china in like a positive or negative light was not something that he was uh particularly interested in yeah okay that that's good yeah and um so i guess re related to that so it's good that mm -hmm. you weren't you were both not jingoistic about china mm -hmm. but um the way you you self-described as like anti-imperial and anti-colonialist i I imagine he might have also signed up for those words, although he might not have offered them up himself. How would you have described like your politics and, and his politics as he hired you? Like, were you the same exact politics as him before? Because it seemed like there was maybe there was like if you're both generous, like there's a lot of like Venn diagram crossover. But there certainly must have been like some things that were not the same. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he was reading uh, like edward saeed's orientalism <laughs> but uh no i mean i'm sure he would be pretty pretty uh outspokenly against um you know any sort of empire building efforts um so i guess the best way to explain this is to start with um something you asked me a second ago which is how did i actually start working for him mm -hmm. uh so at this time i was uh freshly dropped out of college. Um, I was working for Barnes and Noble as a bookseller. Nice. Um, and thus I had quite a lot of time to post on Twitter. I was very <laughs> active on Twitter. Um, and I would find that some of the most fun things you could do on Twitter was you could get famous people or blue checks at the time that meant a little more um, <laughs> blue checks to respond to you. So I would do that a lot. I would just like, you know, comment or at celebrities and try to get them to respond and um, reply dying. <laughs> exactly. And I saw that um, he was running for president. Um, I knew, you know, who he was and I knew he was like into crypto and I was in the crypto and I knew he was funny and kind of crazy. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna like tweet at him and be like, sir, it would be an honor to work for you. Just be like, be like super serious and be like, it would be, you know, an absolute pleasure, pleasure to work for you. Um, so I tweeted that I didn't think about it. I went into a movie, I was going to go see a movie. Um, and then I came out of the movie and he had responded three times. The first was like, he was interested. The second was like, okay, I've gone through your profile and you clearly know what you're doing. And then the third was like, please contact me. Um, and that was it. That was how I got started. Um, I DM'd him. He gave me his phone number uh, and we had an introductory call. And then he immediately started paying me to do social media and youth outreach. Uh, that just that, that is <laughs> fantastic. I... Um, <laughs> So uh, the most watched person on, on my channel before has been uh, Curtis Yarvin. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're aware of him. Oh, and no. yeah, one of his uh, points about humor, which I think you you get and you get it so brilliantly, is that there's a way in which our age, and he, he tracks like the varying degrees of irony 
over the decades from the 20th century to the 21st century. And there's a way in which we have kind of been the frog in the boiling water and the increasing heat has been the increasing kind of humor and irony in the world. And he believes that the kind of like future of politics and the present, as you kind of demonstrated, is being super ironic, but also willing to follow through if people take you up in your humor. So I imagine what you were doing was shit posting, but I'd love to get a definition from you of like what shit posting is because somebody else could have just like backed out, but you like leaned into it. And there's something special about you for leaning into that because I really think other people would have just like, oh, I'm just kidding. Like, I don't have the time or energy to do this. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't use, I think, the word irony too much just because one, I think it can associate me with stuff that I don't necessarily align with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't like some of the, the cruelty, I think, that gets excused as irony. Um, but it's definitely like this was not the first thing for that. I mean, even take the going to China thing, right? Mm -hmm. The way I pitched that to my mom is I came home from school one day and I said, Mom, I'm running away. I'm running away to China. And that was like, I don't know, it was kind of a joke. But yeah. from there, I was like, you know, it slowly kind of plants a seed in your brain. And it's like, well, why not? see if this is possible and then once you realize it's possible it's like well why not do it um and that's definitely something that i have done all of my life since i was a kid um you know in china i would do silly things like you know i was like oh what if i joined the chinese communist youth league and that was just like a joke but then it ended up being a thing and now i'm technically the only at least that i'm aware of the only western member of the chinese communist youth league uh, although I guess I've aged out of that at this point, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> I mean, like I, I, I say all this to explain that for me, I think there is kind of something to being lighthearted that goes along mm -hmm. with being open-minded. So, you know, yes. letting kind of the world, um, guide you and, and, you know, seeing where that, seeing where that brings you. I like it. Yeah. And I like the way you put it, uh, lightheartedly. There's certainly a lot of like, mean-spirited irony on the internet. So I know exactly um, what you're talking about. And you also didn't phrase it in the kind of, uh, there's a puritanical way where some people kind of dogmatically hold to, you never punch down, you only punch yeah, up. I'm not yeah. really even hearing mm -hmm. you say that quite either. Although maybe like as a heuristic, it's kind of a good, I think it might be a good heuristic, but I, I too don't like hold on to it dogmatically. So yeah, a, a kind of lightheartedness and high trait uh, openness, which I, I share. I actually took a personality test with my family one time and one of my sisters was berating me because I scored like a 100 on trait openness. And she's like, that can't be healthy. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this probably, yeah. probably need to curtail something there. Yeah, um, that's funny. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah yeah it's it's interesting those um those traits are are very suitable and i may be getting my dates wrong but were were the high school boys hired to uh in a similar fashion who made their pitch to mike Ravel? was that before or after or at the same time as as you doing this that was after um, that was after okay very shortly after yeah <laughs> okay were you aware of that? And was that like, oh, someone else is like doing this too? Was there any like knowledge of that? Because obviously that was under the uh, Democrat uh, party, whereas uh, John McAfee was in the Libertarian party, like officially capital L Libertarian party. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, was that like on your radar at the time at all? Anything you were paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, I found out about it afterwards um, and thought it was pretty funny as well. I mean, in some ways they were closer to me politically um i uh, you know not a supporter of that party but at least some of the jokes they made were closer to me politically than uh mcafee was but uh yeah I, I do think um i do think what they did is funny i do kind of uh tease about them a bit because i think they're like uh they're they're you know like poli sci grads and you know mm -hmm. working for like think tanks and stuff so uh, I, I appreciated the spirit of the idea, but uh, I don't know. I had a little more fun just being a, a retail employee and, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of climbing the way through uh, just um, 
pure comedy. <laughs> yeah, working class, but also uh, impressive uh, reader. I'm sure if you're sure, working sure. at Barnes and Noble, you know, <laughs> you must be like, yeah. I'm sure no one who hates books works there. That would be quite awkward. It was uh, very funny. I uh, sorry to interrupt you. No, um, no, no. Go ahead. But, uh, at Barnes and Noble, I don't know if you've ever seen. They have like a recommended bookshelf, mm -hmm. um, and I had my own little slot on there. And a lot of my coworkers they would recommend good books, but it'd usually be like, you know, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire before the show had come out and stuff like that. You know, um, like good fantasy books or good fiction books or a really good autobiography or something. But every book I had there was like uh Huey Newton's revolutionary suicide <laughs> like you know so like really serious so yeah. I would always get really excited when anybody decided to actually pick up the books I put there <laughs> yeah I I'll actually tell you I get the teacher's uh discount over there I'm a substitute teacher there you go. Uh, I was teaching at a Catholic school before uh but I'm a substitute teacher now and um they still give it to me and I used to be a paraeducator they gave it to me back then too mm -hmm. um and I always spend too much money when I go to Barnes and Nobles I'm one of yeah. those you know the God, I don't know if it's a real Japanese word. Sometimes I I chain I would check certain online Japanese words with one of my Japanese friends I trained jujitsu with, and he'd be like, uh, "I don't know that thing." Like, <laughs> I forget the word now, but there was one word about like the broken pot, and then you put the gold over it, and he he like didn't know what that word no was idea. at all, though. Uh, but I think Sundoku is the one that they use to say you have a bunch of books but you don't read them. That's definitely mm. me. I have two like giant Home Depot containers filled with books that I'm staring at in front of me that. Uh, I like to uh, lie to myself that it's my anti-library, according to Nassim Taleb, that reminds me how much I, I don't yet know. And working at Barnes & Nobles, I imagine you have that that uh, experience every day. I definitely have like dreamed of having something like that or, or an independent bookstore. Those are always uh, uh, cool as well. Um, so how, how did the rest of the, once you were hired, how did the rest of the campaign go? Because who knows, right? You could have like... Uh, tweeted off for like a month but how, how long were you guys actually like uh working together collaborating on spreading the good word yeah so i was definitely at least working for him for a year um awesome i started to transition into less campaign stuff and more just kind of doing random support things for him um you know he would call me a lot um on the phone and uh something that is like immediately striking with him is uh he is uh just absurdly charismatic um and in a way that i have not experienced before and have not experienced after mm -hmm. um you know he was he did not ever have a cult but if he wanted to he could you know <laughs> so, sometimes you watch or read about those cult documentaries uh or cults that have happened and you're like how did these people fall for this like i would never fall for that but when you talk to somebody like John, they make you feel like you are the most brilliant, important, beautiful person in the world. Uh, and you just feel so good talking to them that it's pretty easy to just kind of fall into a pattern where you're just supporting them and then want to be, you know, around them more. So every phone call I had with them was just uh so much fun or it was inspiring or it was uh exciting you know there was always something to it and in the beginning it was mostly just about like how can i connect with the youth mm -hmm. and obviously i thought the funniest way to do that would be just to be like the most high profile blue check tweeting about anime yeah uh, which now i mean you got elon there's lots of other people kind of did it kim kardashian like posted you know an uh anime girl and stuff like that it's it's not that crazy but at the time it was like kind of exciting it was he was the biggest uh blue check to have uh an anime abby so i was definitely like really trying to get him to watch animes getting him to change his profile picture i would send him like tweet copy and he would just tweet it out without reading it uh so i had a lot of fun there in the early days mostly just focusing on trying to go viral as much as possible that's cool. And what was the feedback you were getting from uh, the people when you were um, sending out this uh, copy via him? Yeah, I mean, people loved it. Uh, I think like I think everybody had fun with it. Um, it was never too um, opinionated to really upset anybody. Uh, so it was it was mostly a lot of fun. There was a lot of just like 
you know, uh, vague references to anti-establishment, which I think, um, especially at the time, a lot of people kind of aligned with some of those grievances. Uh, so it was pretty easy to get a wide range of people on board and didn't really have very many people getting like upset or uh, or ignoring it either. You know, it was mostly positive reactions. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a fascinating thing for people who don't know inside baseball. And I've had a couple of people on who would have uh, knowledge of, for example, the Mises Caucus and various other caucuses, which are mm -hmm. like subdivisions, the inside baseball of the Libertarian, capital L, Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. um, how were you trying to differentiate him from other candidates? Because I remember one of the critiques of like one of the other candidates at the time was that they were trying to just imitate the kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion language of, uh, of the left in order to try to uh, get left and right together in some sort of compromise. Famously, people would always be mad at like Gary Johnson saying that he wouldn't get rid of driver's licenses. You know, he got booed yeah. at the Libertarian Convention before for things like that. Like, what were you trying to do to differentiate uh, John from the other Libertarian candidates? Yeah, I had a pretty simple strategy, which um, honestly came from my, you know, more communist leaning background, which is I focused on phrasing his um, language around revolution. Um, you know, Ron Paul had some of that, mm -hmm. but my kind of, you know, pitch to John, which he, he definitely went with for quite a while, was you can be pretty vague about this as long as you're focusing this concept on lifting up the downtrodden. So, you know, you can actually reach out to members of the LGBT community or um, illegal, uh, you know, undocumented migrants or something. When you use these kind of broad sweeping terms mm -hmm. of, you know, a middle class or a lower class, you know, a lot of these groups uh, align by class and align by their kind of, um, you know, scenario and existence being ignored by the wealthy, being ignored by the government you can create what is still a pretty libertarian, a pretty anti-government kind of narrative uh, that appeals to people who maybe are a little less worried about the debt ceiling and a little more <laughs> worried about like, you know, my boss is an asshole. How am I going to put food on the table? <laughs> yeah, that's very well put. There's a priorities debate amongst people and there's a lot of policing amongst people mm -hmm. within the libertarian party. There are people who, uh, are fully open borders and there are people who like want fully closed borders. There are people who are pro-life and people who are pro-choice. There, like you said, there are people who are aligned with the LGBTQA plus movement. There are people who are like nationalist conservatives, but also libertarian. Like it's one of the crazy things about the libertarian party is like how diverse it actually is, like intellectually mm -hmm. and how eclectic it is. But um, yeah, there's definitely a way in which you could unite them with those broad strokes that you're you're talking about. And it's funny, I, I actually grew up having his antivirus software for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't know if you ever had that. Um, I had that as a kid. It, it used to come like, I think, stock on certain PCs. Mm -hmm. um, and the typical kind of software developer is thought of as this like nerd or even geek who needs a liaison to even communicate with other people in the in the company but like you said he is a man who just like oozes uh, charisma you know like has weapons you know has babes lives internationally is wanted internationally like <laughs> like mm -hmm. so many like fascinating things in his life i think part of it is even his voice i wonder what you think yeah. about it because you're 100%. talking about him being charismatic over the phone you're not even talking about like in real life like in yeah. like like you know when you rank things you go like text and then like above text is phone call above phone call is going to be like a video chat like we're having and then above that is like real life and the charisma it takes to be charismatic over just the phone is is pretty <laughs> it's impressive pretty like mm -hmm. he has almost like a radio dj like deep voice right totally. like I wonder if you could speak to that. And did you ever get a chance for any like live rallies or anything? Yeah. So no, I completely uh, agree in that he had a quite a stunning radio DJ voice. Um, 
I tried several times to meet with him in person and I did end up meeting with a lot of his team. Um, however, uh, the timing about lined up when he had fled the US to Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, and he invited me to Cuba and <laughs> I really wanted to go. Um, I would love to visit Cuba, still would. Uh, and he was explaining to me that uh, I think the way you do it is you fly to the Bahamas first and then you fly to Cuba and they won't give you any problems. But uh, I was having issues um, getting my, my passport renewed and things like that. So I didn't actually have a chance to make it happen before he was uh, on his way to another country. So um, unfortunately, you know, we must have spoke for hundreds of hours on the phone and on video calls and, uh, you know, throughout that year. But uh, I never actually had the chance to, to meet him in person, which is uh, definitely something I'll, I'll always regret. Yeah, it, it is uh, regretful, but it's amazing that you had to, you had all that time that you were able to spend with him. And of course, we're, we're sad at his passing now around the two year mark. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there anything that you think he would want to get out there as like, you know, making his, uh, I mean, he already is, but making him even more like immortal, like to keep his voice alive. Like if he uh, was on this podcast right now, you know, what, what message do you think he'd have for my audience and the good people of 2023? Yeah. I mean, something that I think he would feel, I mean, to just to do my best to speak for him here, something I think he would feel that is not talked about much since his passing is that he was a very loving father and husband. Um, Janice McAfee is his most most recent wife, but it mm -hmm. is um, a uh, very lovely woman. She was one of the sweetest people I've ever talked to. Uh, I think that something that was really important to John was, you know, you do have to kind of think global. You have to consider all of these things on a massive scale. But at the end of the day, having these close personal relationships that you maintain and you support the people around you and you build the support network is as much of a, you know, kind of revolutionary act as, you know, purchasing 10 AK-47s. Um, and I think that the 10 AK-47s is a little more photogenic and a little bit more newsworthy. So I think that's something you would maybe regret is not being discussed as much. Yeah, I, I really like that. That, um, not just replying to you once but replying to you three times and then following through shows i think like a brilliance and executive like quick on your feet executive decision making mm -hmm. but also like this level of personability to to make that contact with you like he really didn't have to do that like he could have been boring and put up like a job ad or something yeah. because you said mm -hmm. that you know but but like he took you up on it and you followed through and uh, that's how I found your work. And it was, it was very uh, beautiful. You mentioned it earlier, um, you know, may his memory be eternal, but you mentioned it earlier. And now I'm curious because at the time, you know, Twitter was under different management and that's where you and I have spent a lot of time. I have had an overall positive view. Of course, there are some like hiccups and things that I don't like, but you know, I'm a podcaster as well. And so, I used to post almost exclusively to YouTube and more recently I've been like posting all my old episodes directly to Twitter, which was an hour mm -hmm. at first. And then now you can go up to two hours. Like I've had a, a good time with that. Um, and it seems to match if not like, um, egalitarian is not the right word in this, in this regard, but maybe the more democratic, like lowercase D democratic, uh, or democratization of the blue check. Like, I wonder what your, your take is on that and on uh, Twitter management in, in general with another, uh, you know, run now by another eccentric uh, rich man. Yeah, I mean, I have mixed feelings. I think that some of the ideas are better than the execution. Um, it's, you know, I understand um, the move fast, break things logic. So I'm mm -hmm. kind of still waiting to see if some of the I'm seeing the move fast and I'm seeing the break things. We'll see if something comes out of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like the kind of move with blue checks actually. Um, I am not a big fan of the for you feed. Uh, you know, there's some things that I'm not a big fan with changes. Uh, 
There are things that I wish more effort were being put into. Uh, I really like Twitter Spaces, but um, Same. I don't know. There's some small things about it. Like, I it frustrates me that you can't um, speak on a Twitter Space on your computer. Like, that's like a very basic thing. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I've never tried it. I, I mm -hmm. switch back from my desktop. I usually upload videos from my desktop and then yep. like kind of go back to my phone. So that's a great question. When do you use your desktop versus your phone? Yeah, I mean, I use my desktop almost exclusively for work and for being on Discord with friends or also for work. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for Twitter spaces, the thing is that I would like to be able to use my microphone, <laughs> not my phone mic, yeah. um, because I do a lot of Twitter spaces um, for work and I, I do a lot of interviews and things like that on there. And um, yeah, I don't know. That's just like a small thing that I would bring up. I was like, you have this amazing feature, but like it breaks sometimes, mm -hmm. can't use it on the computer, which is pretty big for me. Um, and yeah, there was uh, a famous yeah. fl a flop that people poked fun of already for DeSantis' yes, like yes, launch. definitely, right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that there were small things there that like small fixes there that could have made that pretty successful and showcased the utility of this um, of this feature. Um, no. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. No, it's good to be a critic and and still be here. Like you're not one of the ones that fled to Mastodon ever, did, or did you flee no. and come back? I have a Blue Sky account that I don't use, um, but I was Why? sent an invite because uh, yeah. it's it boring. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's just like not much happening there. Is it um, is it the idea of having to build your reputation again from scratch, or is it the the platform itself? Because I've heard like Balaji talk about before. What if there was a feature where you could take your? Because a lot of people like I and I'm with him on this. A lot of people say like, "Oh, hey, Anon, what are you doing?" But I think like it's so much better to say Sudon because it's really not anonymous accounts like sometimes yeah, it's anonymous yeah, yeah. accounts, but it's really like pseudonymous accounts. Mm -hmm. And if there was a way to kind of just copy paste your brand and following the blue sky do you think then you would like is it the building from scratch or it's just nothing going on no over there? it's just that there's i'm happy to return to being a small account for another site um you know i wouldn't want to lose my account on twitter i've had that happen before so i wouldn't want that to happen again but uh i i have no qualms with being on a social media site as a you know small little account again um no it's literally just that like nothing interesting is happening on there right now maybe someday, but like, I don't know. It's not like there's some jokes and they're not any funnier than Twitter. Sometimes they're less funny. There's um, <laughs> some like, you know, journalist posting, but all that stuff's on Twitter too. It's like, until there's something on there that's either not on Twitter or is better than Twitter, I won't be an active user. Yeah, I was not drawn by Truth, nor by Mastodon, nor by Blue Sky. Um, but I, I retain an open mind, as I said. The Gary Vee mentality is if you have the time, money, and energy, be everywhere. Be on everything. You know, if I'm yeah. a millionaire one day, I'll pay someone uh, brilliant and young like you to be on <laughs> be on everywhere, posting yeah. everywhere at least once a day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the the honest way to engage the people if that's, um, if that's the kind of uh, path that you want to uh, go along. And so, um, is there are there any? Uh, we talked a little bit about the past and remembering the John McAfee, but are there any uh, current projects that you are doing that you want people to know about, or that you'd like to share with people that are either uh, directly or tangentially related to that? Yeah, I mean, as much as I loved having these kind of projects that were tied to my brand and to being online. I have moved into a bit more of a, a boring uh, professional kind of partnerships career. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure plugging that is the best. Uh, okay, yeah, let's not do <laughs> I would love to, because in my in my mind, you know, you're talking about be everywhere. I was like, oh, the most of my career has been like telling everybody what I do and what I'm up to and getting them involved. but. For once, I will be restrained and be like, maybe it's best that I, I leave my current work uh, out of this. But um, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. And if I have something fun to plug in the future, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll come back on. <laughs> I, no, I respect it. I had a Twitter account since 2012, very early on when I didn't know what it was. A friend just kind of sent it to me. I deleted it in 2017. I never had a big following, but I was probably around 1,000 at the time. 
-hmm. And, you know, had I continued that, I'm sure it would have been much, much bigger Mm -hmm. now. But I deleted it because of a job that I had. And I was like, you know, afraid of potential backlash. And I was just like, just better not even to go private, just to delete it. So I totally deleted it. Uh, Rage quit that job six months later (laughs) and then came back to Twitter. And I've been building since then. Yeah. And, um, you know, getting getting close to 3K now, but, you know, spreading the word, have interesting mutuals. You honestly have some very interesting mutuals, too, that surprise me. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> um, we're, maybe we can go end on that note. Um, okay. Are there any mutuals that you had that surprised you in a, in a pleasant way and anything you kind of uh, learned from that? Because I, I do think, like, yeah, you, you may have, like, a side but you that trait openness of yours i think is is shown in your mutuals cuz i think like some of your mutuals would hate each other or be bitter enemies of each other oh, totally. but you, <laughs> you but your mutuals with them that. like I, confirm that. I see them argue all the time yeah um, yeah i mean when frog chat was big uh frog chat being like bronze age pervert um nice friends snacky belly um you know uh froggy and all those people um most of whom are gone and some of whom are still around low-key um they had like a week where they were like somewhat obsessed with me for just the shit i was doing with mcafee i think uh so all of them followed me and i still have some of them as mutuals um including ones that have had fallings out like Compot. um yeah Compot is somebody who in the past probably would have uh really not quite liked me but now we're actually i would consider us friends i mean i um, i'm probably going to go out and meet his wife and dog uh in a couple weeks so that's cool uh it is kind of funny how uh you can make those friendships uh even in in uh what are uh quite hostily opposed circles (laughs) yeah i i almost uh i don't want to comment too much on that but i almost still think like that falling out is an op but there are other ones (laughs) that do seem more genuine yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, what is and is not an op these days. Sure. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I really do appreciate your ideological eclecticness and that, <laughs> that value that you said that McAfee had of the personal relationships is, I think that sort of kind of individual personal loyalty, maybe it's an ideology of its own, but mm-hmm. like that could supersede whatever differences you have. Cause I've always felt myself whenever I was in my life and my, my views have changed to be different, like, like very out there compared to people around me where some of my best friends have been geographically distant. And I think the ability to be comfortable with that difference is like a great quality. I don't know if it's possible to engender that in people because I think some people just have a, I mean, I think there's a way to cultivate openness but some people kind of just have it or uh or don't but but thank you so much zoe for coming on uh, the program and like i said if there's any last shout outs or any anything to plug at all uh now's the time i think i'll skip it i think i'll skip it i guess i'll i'll go back to my roots here uh of uh, a book recommendation um i have a single book that sparked my you know political expansion where i really felt like there was something more to politics than you know what you see on the news and that was the one i mentioned earlier revolutionary suicide by huey newton black panther um i highly recommend anybody of any political distinction to read revolutionary suicide i think there's something in there for everyone so that's what i'll leave you with uh, a little book recommendation Thank you. I appreciate that. I did not read Revolutionary Suicide, but in high school, I did a Panther uh, project, one on Kwame Ture uh, yep. and his mm-hmm. his autobiography, uh, Stokely Speaks, that's Stokely mm-hmm. Carmichael, and then also on the Panthers in general. And it was during that time that I grew out my Afro for a year <laughs> and a half. There are amazing, ridiculous pictures. If anyone's That's Facebook awesome. friends with me, they still exist. Some of them with me playing giant chess. Some of it with me uh, uh, making my friend uh, do push-ups with me on their back. And a lot of great uh, pictures. And I would say I grew out my Afro for a year and a half. No lineups, no trimming, nothing. Uh, <laughs> I know the black people in the audience are horrified right now. But the reason I did that was out of respect for Huey Newton. 
for the cartoon character by Aaron Magruder named Huey based off of him, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well as uh, the drummer Questlove from the legendary Roots crew. So I'm, I'm gonna have to check out that book myself and learn a little bit more about the Panthers. So thank you so much, Zoe. 100%, I love that. <laughs>